already. Nora, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. Yeah, well, you know what? I'm here, you're there. Let's do this. Let's bring empowerment to women who are feeling shameful or insecure oh. and just want to be open and magnetic and radiant. Wow, what a topic to dive straight into, right? And I'm dying to know like why you're passionate about this. Like why is this something that you are just like I'm I'm just like out there in the world and doing this work. Twofold. One is because I had over 10 years of anxiety. When I was 24, I had a panic attack in the London underground. I closed off. I didn't trust the universe anymore. I was just like, who am I? What's my purpose? Uh, closed in the sense of contracted in the inside, shy, timid, was afraid of so many things. So I know what it feels like not to feel confident, not to feel radiant or not to feel magnetic. And so now 10 years later, I've closed that loop and now I know what it feels like. And I don't, know anybody who doesn't desire any woman who doesn't desire to feel completely free in themselves and free in self-expression and owning their fullness as a woman mm, yeah and also at the same time it's confronting so when was the moment for you like when was that moment for you where you were confronted with the part of you that was kind of, I always call it like an initiation. Like there's, there's things that happen that are kind of initiating you into that next level of confidence or self-love or whatever it is. So when did that kind of hit for you around becoming a magnetic, radiant woman? Yeah, that, that you're, you're looking for like initiation, like that, that tip, I call it like the tipping point, right? It's like from there to there, how did it tip over? And for me, I grew up in like boarding school, India. I grew up in Asia. I grew up uh, particularly in Nepal and India, where I was kind of wild and free uh, as a teenager. And then I noticed that I started shutting down because I didn't feel safe. And so this whole, it kind of was a whole journey for me of this understanding, like, what do I need to feel safe as a woman? And that can go into any areas of life. And moving to Bali, I moved to Bali about four years ago now. I realized that I feel so safe here. And I still I had to work on myself. So I did a lot of NLP coaching on myself for my coach in India and just realizing the thoughts and the patterns in my mind were causing me this anxiety, causing me not to feel confident. And the tipping point for me was just, I was no longer willing to be this woman that I was. I was no longer wanting to have anxiety. I could feel that it was keeping me small. I could feel that I wanted to just burst out and be radiant and confident in who I was. And so it really is an internal feeling of just like, what am I doing? I don't want to be this way anymore. And until you reach that internal tipping point, nobody can help you because it has to come from the inside. It has to come from you realizing, I do not want to feel this way anymore. Mm. And so when you had that tipping point, when you had that moment, what did you do? Whew, what did I do? Um, like what I, was like the first thing? Because honestly, like sometimes we have those things and we're like, I don't even know where to go from here or what to do or what to do first. So what would you like yeah. next step? Yeah. So for me, what my anxiety taught me in all the different therapies, I never took anxiety medication. I, w I have a very holistic family and my father's like a yoga yoga teacher. So he always was like, don't go on medi med um, medication. So what I was doing throughout my anxiety, I was doing lots of different therapeutic methods. Like I did uh, EFT, which is emotional freedom, right? Tapping. I did that for a whole while with a therapist. I did like a dance kind of therapy from Georgia. I can't even say his name. It's from like <laughs> It's like your gift, okay. whatever. Can't say his name. Um, doesn't it's irrelevant. It was amazing. It really helped me like be okay with not being in control. So you were asking like, what did I do next? What I learned about my anxiety was self compassion and the littlest of things that I could do. I just was like, wow, Nora, I am so proud of you. So when I reached that tipping point, it wasn't immediately from one day to the next. I was fine, but I had so much self-compassion. So then I really tuned inwards and I was like, you know what? I need support. I need support in this. And, and often we think like, it's, it's like, I am not worthy of asking for help or like, I don't deserve this. Is it like, I call this the underlying this ease of being a modern woman is thinking we have to be so independent and do things alone. So I, I reached out and was like, I need help. Well, who can I get it from? And again, I tried many different things until I found my NLP therapist because I knew it was all about the thoughts in my mind. Mm -hmm. Everything on the outside is a reflection of what we think on the inside. So then my next step was to get support into really like checking the viruses of my system and being like, 
what can I delete out of this? Yes, it's so important, isn't it? And, you know, as you continued on that journey, so I think, you know, seeking support is a big one and also a hard one for people to actually want to do that. And, you know, I even noticed, noticed now as, as, I, as I've been pulling back deeper layers of my own onion is that you get to some deeper levels of, you know, shame and all of those things around things that other people probably don't have shame around, but there is something that's like tied within you. And it's almost like what, what I used to be was like, I'm just, this feels so shameful to me that I don't even want to ask for help. Like, I don't know how to ask for help. So I'm just going to keep this in. And I'm noticing like, right now how freeing it actually is feeling and how um how much power i actually have been getting by reaching out and asking for help and and letting it be not this secret you know letting it just be like it's out there and it's and you're kind of putting out to the universe that i'm ready to heal this part of me i'm ready to take responsibility or take it you know or clear this energy or whatever and it's actually so freeing and i've never had this ever in my life around asking for help Ah, yeah and I feel the relief and the freedom that you're just by you explaining that and I totally agree it's what happens is ultimately we all just want to be loved and this comes from childhood this comes from like you know just wanting the love from your guardians or your parents and it translates into adulthood the same way we just want to be loved so when you feel like you're not deserving and you feel like you're going to do something wrong by asking for help ultimately it's you just wanting to be loved so you're pulling back from asking for help and support because you think you might be rejected which means you're not going to be loved and so it's so painful and we do everything in life to avoid pain we are not oriented towards pleasure we are pain averse and yeah. so that fear of asking for help, just, you know, you can put your hand on your heart and be like, I love you so much. So I say that to myself. I'm like, Nora, I love you so much. I understand that you're afraid of asking for help. And yet I know you're doing that because all you want is to be loved. And you think that maybe if you're going to ask for help that, you know, they might reject you by saying, no, I can't help you. And that's, that's okay. I love you. I'm here for you. So it all circles back to like being pain avoidant. Yeah, I love that. I love the the self compassion part of this because often it's a part that we miss, right? Like, often we're our biggest critic, or we're so hard on ourselves, and you know, our, our inner critic is there strongly than our than our compassion itself. And so, I think just bringing some awareness and and compassion into our hearts and into ourselves on a daily basis is so needed. And sometimes it's even like, it's it, sometimes that's even hard to believe. You know, I've had so many women that I work with and so many say to me, Sam, I don't know how to love myself. Like I don't even like myself. And so I'm like, I get it. Like, and it's, it's such a journey of just, I love that you put your hand on your heart and you're just like, you know, I love you. Like, and it's, sometimes it's even just that, like starting to get connected to our bodies, like putting our hands on our heart, doing that kind of stuff. Right. Oh, so yeah. no, no, it's totally. And it's so interesting because it's like self-love is such a big term online. And I'm like, yeah. I don't relate to like self-love because I'm like, I don't know how to love myself. I've been, not that I've been taught not to love myself, but it's, it's such a like esoteric term and so broad in general. So I've actually broken it down for myself and my clients to be like, what can I do to appreciate myself? Okay. Mm -hmm. So what can I do? And I just be like, Nora, I appreciate you. I appreciate you that you walked out the door today. I appreciate that you got out of bed. So it's much smaller, incremental, like little like dribbling of like the love instead of like self-love. And you're like, oh my God, how do I start loving myself when I hate myself? No, you can just start to appreciate. And what happens, the word itself means to rise, right? To appreciate, right? If stocks appreciate means they go up. So by appreciating yourself, slowly, slowly, you're building that self-compassion and in the end, the self-love. But like, I'm so averse to the term self-love because I'm just like, what does it mean? How do I do it? Yeah. It's almost like it's like said to be this destination when it's not, I think it's an unfolding and unraveling and evolving journey that you're on constantly. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I listened to Aubrey Marcus podcast and I listened to an amazing one the other day and they put out this um, concept that instead of like, you know, being hard on yourself or, or like having to make a decision or, you know, trying to search for self-love, if you just ask your question, when, like when you're in a you know decision you need to make or you're in a circumstance that calls for it of saying, if I were to love myself, what would I do? 
Yeah. And I was just like, that is amazing. It's almost like, what would love do? Or like you're thinking of, it's like not even saying that I have to, in this situation right now, love myself. It's saying, if I did, how would I respond or how would I act? And I think that's such a good invitation. Yeah. So I listened to a lot of Teal Swan. And a year ago when I was in Sydney, I had this decision I need to make. I did some landmark forum, which is like an educational, emotional intelligence boot camp. And I like was meant to be in Australia for a couple months. And then I was just like, I don't feel like it. I just want to go back to Bali. And then so I was just in the end, I was just like, what would somebody who loved herself do? Like, that's how she phrases it, Teal Swan. And I was like, wow. And the answer is immediately there. Then it's about the follow through. So I totally resonate with what you're saying. I just use a different phrase for it, but it's true. It's like, I say that all the time. And I'm just like, yeah. wow, that softens me. That question softens me. Softens me. And then it's my decision. Am, am I going to follow through with that or not? Oh yeah. At the moment I'm like really start, I'm really taking on the queen archetype, right? And in this mm. podcast series, we're going to go a lot into the female archetypes. Oh yes. But, but for me, like, um, I, this year, I came into this year, 2020, like, and, and said, I'm going to embody the queen archetype. And I'm going to create my own stuff. Like, what does that mean for me? Like, how is she going to show up? And so now when I'm faced with like, you know, like a, a, a detour or a hard situation or whatever, my response is, what would the queen do? Like, what would, yes. I, what would a queen do? And I automatically, like, it's like making me handle life so much better. Cause I'm just like, okay, she would do this. It's like, okay, so do that. And it's, I love it's that. I'm totally, I totally resonate with the queen. Cause I'm just like, yeah, I am not willing to be anything else in my life. Absolutely not. I want to be the queen who served her empire with compassion and heart. Like that for me is the queen. And that's what I talk about magnetism and radiance. It's like I have a term called hashtag queening it, which is the, 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 the title of my mastermind, which I'm I launching. Which is that. The, it's just the feminine in business where you sit back on your throne, you know, hands up on your beautiful carved elaborate gemstone throne. You've got your crown on and you're just radiating and people are magnetized to you because you're coming from the heart. You're leading with courage and compassion and you're overseeing your empire and your empire is devoting themselves to you and you've got people doing things for you out of love and not out of this like servant attitude but they're willing they are showing up for you because of who you are and what you are embodying inside mm. so talk to me about what magnetic means or what like a magnetic woman looks like Oh, magnetic woman is just like, and, and it's, it's funny because I've been playing with this term myself. So I'm like, okay, if I turn on my own magnetism, what's going to happen? And let's see. And what happens is people come up to me, men, women, it doesn't matter. And they come up to me and they're just like, I want to be your friend. Okay. It's that attraction of like, I want what she has. What does she have? And for me, a magnetic woman is so confident in herself. It doesn't mean she has doubts because I still have doubts, but she's able to have that self-compassion that it's okay to have doubts. I'm still a full woman. And talking about full woman, a, a, a magnetic woman is one who fully embodies all aspects of herself. So that means her emotions, her wild side, her soft, nurturing, caring side. And she's not afraid to express it. She's not afraid to express her needs and desires, particularly around men. Men love it when you're able to express what you truly desire and what you truly want, because then they're able to fulfill it more. And men love nothing more than to please a woman. Mm. So how did you begin to tap into these different parts of you and bring them to life? Mm. It really started with sensuality for me. So I mentioned that I was growing up in India where I started to shut down because I was getting all this male attention being a white, you know, 16 to 18 year old in India. And I didn't feel good for me. So I orient my life according to feeling good. When something doesn't feel good, I used to just shut down. So then I started wearing like different things, like not like being pretty or all of that. And then it just continued after I left India. So moving then to Bali and really starting to embody myself more, I felt a part of me was missing. And with the anxiety, I knew I wasn't the Nora or the potential of the Nora that I could be. And I then started with sensuality. So, you know, my, my, my dad is a, is a yoga philosopher, meditation guy. So I grew up in India. I grew up around Tantra. Like I know all of this stuff and I don't use Tantra because it has such a stigmatism around it. But for me, Tantra is an enriching of your life experience. It's a, it's a, a allowing of the pleasure of this life in order to lead towards enlightenment. Whereas every other um, spiritual practice, I shouldn't say every, that's a, that's a truth claim. Most of the other spiritual practices negate reality because we're trying to move away from it to enlightenment. Whereas Tantra is very much in this physical body. What are you feeling right now? How can you use this to elevate? 
okay? Mm -hmm. And so for me, sensuality is like, okay, it's how we interpret reality. Without our senses, we'd just be a blob of disconnection. Mm -hmm. So how can we tune in into what is going on around us in order to enrich the experience of life? So when I started tuning into sensuality, I was like, wow, it makes me feel alive. And that is then the difference of how I was feeling before. It's like scared, dull, numb, and then slowly tuning in. Like just right now, if you're listening to this podcast or you right now, it's just like close your eyes and just can you feel the sensation of the air on your skin? And just allow yourself to feel that. What does that actually feel like? And there's no right or wrong to feeling. It just is. But even that, it's like when you tune into that, it's, it can be so pleasurable. And this is like a mindful practice. And it's like, can you feel the difference of where your clothes are touching your skin to where your skin is exposed? And allowing yourself to like luxuriate in that feeling. So that's just like a small thing like that. When I, often when I do this in my workshops with my clients, they're like, wow, I never thought about the air touching my skin. And it's like, well, we don't think about so much because we're so busy with everything that we want to do in life. So taking a step back for that to really enjoy the pleasure that we can get from our senses. And that leads to an aliveness. That leads to this like, wow, I feel it. I feel it. And so when I'm walking around and I'm in my sensuality, which is just really being aware of my senses, right? People come up to me and, and it's even just like I'm sitting there. I'm just like, oh. and then people are like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> I want some of that because I'm so enjoying myself. And if you look, if you think of it this way, if you see a woman on the dance floor who's just like letting loose, she does not care. She's got the biggest smile on her face. You're looking at her and you're thinking, wow, right? It's like, she is so free. Like she looks so happy. Like you're thinking that. And it's the same thing. You don't have to be on the dance floor, but you can embody that in every day too. Mm. Oh, I love that. I mean, usually the person on the dance floor, so I don't think I've actually watched someone on the dance floor before. So I'm like too into it. But I was going to say like recently I've had a lot of conversations and I've had my own understanding of the moments in which I want to tap out of my body. Like, and I want to tap out of the present moment. And my phone has been a huge distraction from, from me being in the present moment or accessing mm -hmm. some feelings that maybe are uncomfortable and I think that's what also can show up for people is like, there's this um, barrier to feeling this pleasure that you're talking about and feeling this mag magnetism because it takes us being so in our body, so in the present moment and feeling things that maybe are uncomfortable for a moment. And so we quickly tap out, right? Whether that's scrolling Instagram or whether that's like Netflix or whether whatever it is, it's like whatever mm. we can do to get us out of that feeling body and yet I think we have, we not, we're not actually realizing what power is on the other side of just sitting in it and being in it. So if there is a practice or if there is like a, if there's something that people can do to move through the barrier, like what would you suggest? It's, it's difficult because we're scared of barriers. We're like, it's going to be difficult. So I, even I find this very difficult, but I try and schedule it into my calendar of like a time block where I'm not doing anything because mm. we're so busy with doing and our to-do list that we have forgotten how to just be. And yeah. we are he human beings, right? And I always say we are human feelings, like we are meant to feel. And so like schedule in, even if it's just half an hour, even if it's just five minutes, like it doesn't have to be 10 hours or three hours, okay? But it's where you're not doing doing anything but that means you're not journaling you're not reading you're not listening to music you can be just sitting you can look at the view or something like that but that is like a training for yourself to just kind of be like okay I don't have to be anything else but whatever I am right here and right now and because of the way the industrial revolution and how society functions is like we are so conditioned to always be doing something that we have forgotten how to do nothing no thing yeah okay I think that's a really good take for people like to just no matter where you're at and if you're listening to this it's like just make the time, like do the, do make time to do nothing. Like how it's so bizarre that we have to make time to do that, but it's just like, but it's a thing. Like, and I think, you know, start for me, starting at sitting in nature or sitting like at the ocean and looking at the ocean, I could do it for hours. Like you just get lost in nothingness and it feels so beautiful. So even starting there is a really good place, I think. 
totally and 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 sorry one one last thing i just wanted to say it's like what has to happen is like you were saying in the tipping point is like what is your priority in life are you willing to go through the discomfort to get where you want to be because mm. if you don't want it badly enough you're not going to take the actions you need to do to get it so i have a neon sign being made for my house which says in bright pink how badly do you want it <laughs> because okay. That's it. Like, that's the question you got to ask yourself. How badly do I want to be a fully embodied magnetic radiant woman? Mm -hmm. How badly am I willing to let go of the old self, which is not serving who I want to be? And if you want it badly enough, you're going to go through the motions that you need to be, need to do in order to get where you want to go. And that's like the, the kind of rags to riches stories. It's like, they're not willing to be there anymore. And so they do whatever the rejection doesn't matter for them because they are want it so badly. So you've got to ask yourself that question. And that's one of my motto, mottos is like, how badly do I want it? Because, you know, if I want 10 new clients, how badly do I want those 10 new clients? I'm not going to let my limiting beliefs stop me from going and messaging people or phoning people up or, you know, emailing my list, like, because I want it. But we let our stories stop us because mm. we are afraid not to get loved. Yeah. Mm. So how does this move into, um, like in for you, how do you, how do you, you now like going through this and, and being who you are, what is your way in which you go deeper into your own experience? Oh, so like, what's your edge right now? Yeah. So for me, I'm really big in authentic relating and relationships. So I, I have three topics in my life that are just three main topics, I should say, and that's self-worth, feminine embodiment and relationships. And right now I'm really diving into relationships. I had codependent relationships where I was following men around the world since, you know, my 16 year old self, like hopping on the back of bad boy motorcycles in India and Goa. And then that, that continued. I moved to like Brazil with for a boy, I moved to South Africa for a man, like all of these kind of things. So then I was like, this can't be how I want to have relationships. For the last four years, I've been studying relationships. I'm an authentic relating um, facilitator. I've been trained in leadership through authentic relating. So for me, the edge is Every time I feel uncomfortable, it's something that I need to share. So all those things, I'm like, I'm not going to share that. I'm like, shit, I'm going to share that. So it's really about being in tune with how am I feeling? How are others impacting me? Or what are the stories that I've got going on that the actions of others are making me feel that way? Because there is no blame in this world. It's all about what we believe in our belief systems and our stories. So mm -hmm. my edge right now is being like, how much of a leader can I be? And showing up fully for what's going on inside of me. And then making that a revealing experience for those around me so that they can be closer to me. So that's emotional intimacy. And that might sound like a whole big jargon, but basically my practice at the moment is like, I feel something, I feel like maybe I shouldn't share it. Maybe it's gonna trigger something in the person. Oh, maybe it's gonna trigger my rejection issues or is like this. And I feel that, I know everyone has felt it. Like you're in a group and you're like, ah, you got this feeling. You're like, oh, it's my turn to speak, but I don't wanna speak, right? Everyone knows that feeling. I share it. And it is so edgy because it's like, what's going to happen next? Mm. Why do you think we, why do you think that we don't speak up? Oh, it's all our fears and belief systems of like, Oh my God, I'm, I'm not worthy. I'm going to get rejected. I'm going to be abandoned. They're not going to love me because I won't be part of the tribe. And I don't think like them. It's our core underlying issues, which ultimately comes back to, we just want to be loved and we do everything we can to protect ourselves from not feeling the pain of not thinking that we're going to be loved. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's such an interesting thing. Like I, like for me, communication is like a number one value for me in relationships and friendships, all of that stuff. And I recognize like in not even just intimate relationships, but in friendships or, or um, like family relationships, you know, this, um, this kind of fear this fear that creeps in for people in communicating, in communicating what's going on for them. And this, this yeah. need to just like either shut people out or pretend yeah. that everything's all cool, but like act differently. And you know, yeah. it's like, it, it actually, by not speaking out, it's actually damaging relationships around you. Yeah, totally. Totally. But it's our, it's our biggest fear is like not to be abandoned or to be left or all of that. And so we're like, no, I'm going to edit myself because I know what triggers them or I know what's going to happen. So I'm not going to say what I truly feel, but that just leads to even more disconnect. 
it leads to yeah it leads to disconnect and it leads to odd behavior where you you recognize that there's something not quite right or there's some tension or there's whatever and so then it still creates something anyway but now it's just like this weird tiptoeing around because everyone knows something's up but no one's speaking about it like it's such a weird concept so um what are your do you have like ways in which you help people be able to tap into that authentic relating ah uh, it's it's I think it comes down to, first of all, working with what are your true fears? Like, okay, it might be, yes, for everyone, it's like, yeah, fear of not being loved, but it, it like morphs into different things of like, I'm not deserving, I'm not good enough. So for me, it was very much having to prove myself to get the love for my dad is one of my core childhood wounds. And so when it comes to in like love relationships, I always felt like I needed to prove myself to get the love from my partner. So for everyone, it like is a little bit different, but it's really looking at your childhood core wounds because it manifests as this like, as adults, we don't necessarily get triggered, but it's our childhood, it's our inner children that are getting trauma, that have been traumatized, internalized that they weren't, weren't loved. And it continues and it's still showing up in adulthood because a, a logical adult will know that this isn't the case. Everyone's, you know, open to their viewpoint. Of course, I'm not going to get rejected, right? Mm. So we're having these like little children rule our uh, adult emotional life. So I always start with like, what are your children's, inner children's emotional needs that haven't been met? Mm. So when you understand that, you can see the pattern in each of your relationships. And so for me, it was like, I'd get together with a guy. I'd be like, this amazing Nora, because like, look at me. Of course you got to love me. Uh, and then, and then it would like fizzle out because you can't, that's not sustainable. You can't always be proving your love because that's really tiring. So when I found that my inner childhood core wound was like, I was always thinking, I always needed to thinking because it wasn't true, needed to prove my, uh, myself to get the love for my dad. Then I could see it in all my relationship patterns. So my advice is be like to sit down and a good way to think about what is your childhood uh, core wounds? It may be more than one is what is a negative self-talk that is always there, mm. right? Cause that can then lead to something that you internalize that happened as a child. Mm. I love that. How does this connect and relate to speaking up in sex or in, in intimate intimacy with your partner around your, you know, sexual desires or, you know, sexual needs or relationship needs that aren't being met because often we can put a bit of a, you know, a lid on that conversation as well and just just settle in relationships and not have our needs met but become resentful and all sorts of things are going on just because we're not able to say, hey, I want you to X, Y, Z, you know? And so what is, is this a similar thing? Well, I think when it comes to relationships and de definitely around sexual intimacy is that a lot of women, and I know this for myself through my anxiety, is the number one priority you have to think about in your life is where do I feel safe? How do I feel safe with my partner? Because when, you feel when women feel safe in general, they are blossom. Basically, they just blossom. So I want you to go back and really think about like, okay, in my partnership, do I actually feel safe? Where do I not feel safe? What do I need to feel safe? Because if you feel safe with your partner, for example, you would tell him what your needs are, but you don't feel safe because you think there might be a reaction that you might get rejected or you might be doing something wrong. So you're not feeling safe. You've got this insecurity, underlying insecurity, which is preventing you from actually sharing your desires. So it really is about safety. I just got goosebumps from that because Same. it's so important. <laughs> and the more that you think about safety in your life, and this doesn't only have to be sexual intimacy in anything, in your career, in your spirituality, whatever aspect, right? What do I need to feel safe? Because when we feel safe, we do exactly and we go for exactly what we want. Yeah. And this is so important. And the very like first episode of this season with Josh and Alicia, we jammed on this, like we jammed on the concept and, you know, my friend Josh was like talking about his relationship that he's in now. What it's not just like, it wasn't just like a couple of weeks of him showing up and, and, and proving to her that he's going to be there. It was like years of like dedication to his own inner work every single day and then showing up in his relationship with consistency so that mm. she now can rewire her, st her story because she trusts that he's fully going to be there and she yeah. can deliver and, and express anything. And he's there for her. Like he, he's got her, he's not going to drop it. He's not going to, you know, and I think that's what building safety and trust looks like. I think we have to get clear on what it actually is like really specifically because 
when we throw out the words like, oh yeah, I trust my partner. Oh yeah, I feel safe with my partner. We're not talking about the, the nature of who they are. Like I've had beautiful mm. connections with men that are incredible men and, and, you know, beautiful nature, but they have, they shown up in ways to make me feel like they're going to be there. If I express all of me, not all of them, no, and not all the time. And it's like, so it's like those things, what do we need? And then if we've identified, so just say we've identified that there is a, there is a opportunity for my partner to show up better to, to, for me to feel safe or to do something different that I would need to feel safe. How do I bring that to bring that to them? And, you know, it all comes down to communication. So for me, a foundation of a, a good, a great flourishing relationship is truth, safety, and freedom. And they build upon each other. You've got to be able to share your truths. And that means you need to know what's going on inside of you. And you need to feel, okay, I can share this. And I need to share this if I really want a beautiful, flourishing, and nourishing relationship. Sharing your truths. That leads to the feeling of safety because you know you and your partner can share whatever is coming up for both of you and can communicate and build upon that, which leads to complete freedom in your relationship. Because if you know that you've got safety and the truth is there, you're free to do whatever you want because you've got the two foundational uh, building blocks already. And so it comes back to like, okay, how badly do you want a flourishing, beautiful relationship? How badly are you going to be honest and truthful with yourself and what's going on? How can you recognize how your inner child is playing up and play and having emotional temper tantrums in your adult life? It all just circles back to the same things, but truth, safety, and freedom are the foundations of beautiful, epic relationships. Mm. Do you think that um, relationships that perhaps haven't had those pillars, haven't had the passion, desire, and the sexual needs met, but they've been together for a while, do you think that there is, do you think that change can be made? Or do you think it's kind of like, oh, well, like we just, we, like there's, we either end it or we stay in this that we're not entirely happy with? Like, or do you think that there is always a chance for it to turn around? I think there's always a chance for it to turn around. What happens, what kills relationships is assumptions. So you, when, the longer you are with someone, the more assumptions that you just play the rules by and the context stay the same. So you're like, for example, your partner, you know, you're like, oh, he always likes his coffee black, but that's not allowing him the chance to change, right? And so assumptions are like constricting your relationship. So it's like, I get this question often with, with couples that I work with. It's like, oh my God, we've fallen into the mundane. You know what happened six months, you know, we were passionate and erotic and the sex was epic and now life just goes on and like what happened to that passion well it's because you've fallen into this like okay normalization there's no more eroticism there's no more like tension in the pool between you and you know when you're in the first six months yes it's also hormonal based because like as as women we're like procreation we want to procreate so everything's in overdrive because make the baby survival of our species okay so that is natural and scientific in the first six months it takes complete commitment to say like yes you know what i'm going to show up for you every day i'm not going to make the assumptions that you yesterday are lying beside me in bed is going to be the same person that works up that wakes up next to me being curious about each other consistently and if you think about the first six months of a relationship you are so curious about each other you just want to get to know each other and then that fizzles out as you think that you know them mm. and then you're just not curious about each other anymore you just fall into the normality of being together and so I think you can totally change your relationship by starting to be curious. And that's something we do in authentic relating. It's like, okay, how can we be that curious child? And I'm sitting in front of you and I think I may know what's going on for you. Even if, if I've been together with my partner for 10 years, no, let's actually have a conversation about revealing what is going on in your mind in this present moment. So there's always a possibility for change, always a possibility. Okay. Let's see each other new. Mm, I really love that response. I love that answer because I think curiosity is such a gift for us as humans to, to cultivate, you know, and I think, and I've really never heard it in that concept, but it makes so much sense because you're often in a, if you're in a long-term committed monogamous relationship, then it's you and the other person for a long time. And, and often the fear is like, you know, what if I, what if they leave me? But we're not like we're having those thoughts and, and kind of looking for evidence to prove that story. Whereas if we just got curious, because I know for me and I'm probably the same for you is like, I'm changing like daily at the moment, like so much change is going on. And so if you have 
like this curiosity about that person and that maybe who they were last week is somebody totally different this week. And maybe something that was off the, off the table last week is now on the table this week. Cause they're, yeah. you know, and so it's like, yeah. it's getting curious. And then with that curiosity, what do you do with it? Like, how do you, do you, is that something that you should internalize or is it something that you bring to the table with questions or what is, what do you do? Yeah, I would bring, I would bring to the table with questions and be like, Hey, I'm feeling this, or I'm curious about this. And maybe I'd like to explore this together. Uh, and that leads to new experiences together, which brings back to intimacy together. And, and I just want to share a really beautiful practice you can do with your partner, just sit in front of each other. And the first person who decides to go first, you can point to your partner and be like, you go first. But the, the sentence stem in authentic relating, we use a lot of sentence stems. And the first person would start with being here with you now, I notice. And then you share what you're noticing. And it could be a feeling. It could be that your toe is itchy. You could be feeling, wow, I feel so much hatred towards you. Whatever. You're just sharing what you notice. And then your partner will then reply or you reply, depending on who goes first, hearing that I notice. Okay? And then it just continues. So it's like being here with you, I notice. And then you, for example, Sam would should, say, should we do a little, should we yeah, do a little yeah. thing? This is yeah, yeah, we can do it. We can do it. <laughs> okay. uh, and then it just, and it goes back and forth. So after you've shared hearing that, I notice, I would then go, well, hearing that, I notice. So what's happening is you're sharing uh, your internal feelings and what's going on with you, but in the present moment, in relation to each other, not externally. It's like, it's, it's basically intimate, intimate connection. And it's a, such a beautiful practice to kind of drop in together and start sharing from the heart. So we can do it. We can do a round. So uh, you want to start and I'll, I'll Okay. So I'll I say, um, so being here with you in this moment, I notice uh, like calmness in my body. Hmm. Uh, hearing that I noticed that I wasn't feeling so calm, but I am now. Hearing that in this moment, I notice that I feel inspired. Hmm. And hearing that in this moment, I notice that that caused this little fluttering sensations around my heart. And hearing that in this moment, I notice that it makes me want to dance. Oh, and hearing that in this moment makes me want to like move my upper body. Like I'm feeling stiff and yeah. Ooh. <laughs> oh how good is that i love i love exercises <laughs> like this so that's so simple to just play yeah. like no matter what's going on and yeah. i've played it with um uh, actually men before in my life and what i've noticed is that if you can put a, a longer time frame on on it then all of a sudden you can get to some depth and then the real stuff starts to come out of the thing that you actually needed to say but it's in yeah. an environment that feels super safe to do that yeah totally Totally. I love that. It's such a simple noticing game. It's just bringing you into presence together yeah. because like my big thing around relationships is we live in a relational society. We don't live as sadhus or monks away from each other. No, we live in relation. It doesn't matter if it's a love relation, work relation, family relation, right? Mm -hmm. And nobody has taught us about how to show up in relationships because it's all coming out of fear. It's not coming based out of love. And so I'm such a sucker for teaching authentic relating in relationships because for the fact that we are surrounded by by so many relationships and we don't know how to show up for them yeah so important what do you find inspiring about relationships in your life that there's always more to share so you could have been talking for like three hours but there's always more that you can be sharing around what you're feeling and what's truly going on with you you're like oh, i don't need to talk to that person no i am done no there's always more and deeper layers to go and what do you find most challenging about relationships in your life? Um, what I find most challenging is, uh, I'm trying to see, is it like a specific relation or in general, my relationships? Um, I don't find anything really challenging at this moment because it's more my practice to edge myself more into vulnerability. Um, and I host events in authentic relating in connection here in Bali all the time. So for me, it's the challenge is how can I show up fully in all of my beliefs? 
and sharing from that place of inspiration so that I can create this ripple effect where people can come up to me and be like, wow, Nora, like the way that you led that, that was inspiring because I know what happens when somebody feels touched or, or, or one of my other theories is we all want to be seen, heard and appreciated. So mm -hmm. how can I be the Nora that sees, hears and appreciates people? Because when that touches the core of their being, it changes who they are because they felt that. They felt that they matter. They felt the love. And then they walk out of that room or out of my presence and they can then, because they felt it, do it to other people too. And that's that ripple effect. So my challenge is like, okay, how can I be that Nora? Yeah. I love that because it's not about, you know, that quote, like it's not about what they, what the person said. It's about how they made, they made you feel. And that's what you, when you remember, right? It's the same as, it's exactly the same concept as embodiment work, right? We talk about yeah. embodiment work a lot because once you feel something and experience something, instead of just reading it or hearing about it, yeah. the, the game changes. Yeah, totally. Um, totally. Okay. So besides authentic relationships and authentic relating, what is alive on your heart? Like, what are you just in the moment right now? Like, what are you so passionate about? To uh, it definitely uh, like at the moment the, the topic is like femininity and like how do you welcome the, the fullness of the woman that you are in, in all, aspect, all aspects it's like how do you create more beauty in your life how do you allow more pleasure to be like take over the, the fullness of your being and so it's like I'm always like searching for um, ways to translate that because I can feel it but how can I provide the framework for other women to feel it because it's so free I and mean, what we truly I'm, uh, I made a bold statement online the other day and I was like what we truly desire as women is freedom and it's the freedom of full self-expression and we feel like it's not okay to be fully ourselves so that's like a topic that I'm really currently like reading books about and I must say like I'm really into um, uh, learning to become a femdom and that's really owning my power so that's like a, other people might know it as dominatrix right and I know because men love to serve so I'm using it as almost like a healing aspect of myself of like owning my power owning my needs and desires and creating a framework around it where I get to then it might sound negative I realize but it's actually in my viewpoint and how I want to do it it's a healing experience for myself and for those others that are involved so like femininity really owning yourself claiming what you want in life like all of that is my current kind of like juicy topics <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. I just got the biggest goosebumps around this because my whole intention for this year is around ownership and pleasure. And yeah. it's exactly that. It's like the fem the femdom is like, I want to not lose my ambition and drive and purpose in the world, but I don't want to close my heart off and become full masculine and alpha driven yeah. because I know at my core and the feminine essence. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. it's about learning how they can coexist and learning how to dance with them. And not because I've gone in both extremes, right? I've gone in yeah, an extreme yeah. of shutting down and I've gone in the extreme of being too feminine, losing my ambition. And so yeah. it's like, oh, okay, where are you at with this? <laughs> Well, I'm, 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 how do you do it? I'm, uh, so my main thing with that, so a lot of women come to me saying like, well, how do I reconnect to my femininity? And so I always ask them to journal on like, what makes you feel feminine? And that's different for every woman. So for me, it's like, I love having long hair. I love wearing flowy things, but that doesn't necessarily mean like feminine. Okay. It really depends on you So make a big list, at least 50 ways that you like, that you feel feminine. People stop at like 10. And I'm like, no, no, no. I need you to go deeper. 50 ways that make you feel feminine. And then make sure you do at least two at least two of those every single day. So you're practicing cultivating your femininity. So for me, a feminine, feminine is very much like it's courage, it's compassion, it's creating beauty, it's nurturing, it's receiving, it's dancing, moving. So in Indian philosophy, it's Shakti, right? Female is Shiva, it's consciousness, pure consciousness, it's static. And the Shakti, it's the energy, it's the vibration. And together, Shiva and Shakti create the world. And we both need each other. So it's not about negating the feminine or the masculine, but you have to understand Shakti is pure vibration. It's pure energy. It needs to move. So if you're not moving every day in your life, I highly suggest that as one of your practices. Get moving, whether that's walking or dancing or just like flowing around your house or swimming. It doesn't matter. That is the core of being feminine is that vibration. It's that energy moving the energy. What happens when you stagnate is that your emotions start to stagnate too. You start to get frustrated and angry boils up you start to get more masculine very much masculine traits 
So make a list, 50 ways that you like to feel feminine or that make you feel feminine and do it. Why are you not doing it? Because you're too busy. Well, again, what's your priority? Mm -hmm. How much do you want to be a fully embodied woman? Is it as simple as like, you know, having an altar, lighting a candle, drinking a cup of tea, buying yourself flowers? Oh, no, no, no. Men have to buy me flowers. I'm like, no. First of all, I buy myself flowers. Secondly, I tell my man, I'm like, hey, I want some flowers. And then he goes and buys them for me. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, yeah, I definitely know for me, it's being connected to my body and dance is a huge part of that. And even like literally today, I got back into this because in the last week, I was like, why do I just, what's happening? Like I feel, yeah. and I was like, oh, because I lost that practice because I've been super yeah. busy and, and, you know, not at home and blah, 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 all these excuses. And so I'm like, cool, five minutes, that's all I need. Yeah to just get into my hips and, you know, move and like do the sensual movements to my body. And I'm like, ah, there she is. Like, it's just yeah, something. I'm, so back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> so, um, I really love that. And I think I highly recommend that. And I'm excited to see this journey unfold for you with the hashtag fandom, because I think <laughs> I'm very much in that dance with you. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Yeah. There's some great books. I'll share those. <laughs> Uh, and I've also got a beautiful playlist. So if you want to sign, sign up for my playlist, if that's Oof. okay, it's, it's, it's norawendell.com forward slash sensual dash Sunday dash playlist. And you can sign on and I send out a new playlist every couple of weeks, every month or so. And it's like sensual feminine music where you just cannot help but feel. And it's so good. So I pop, pop those on and just like move and feel and just like allow that wholeheartedness of my being to radiate oh i love that so much on um, where we're on that note too where can people go to find out what like where you are online and all the things yeah so i'm like really big on instagram i love my instagram and all of my posts are just like how to's and captions of like what's going on in my life how am i dealing with it what, where do where am i finding my self-worth and uh, feminine embodiment what can i do and then relationships this is what's going on so uh, my instagram is at nora wendell it's n-o-r-a-w-e-n-d-e-l and then yeah my website and I would say newsletter because I don't really update my website, but on, I've got every Monday, a, mo a Monday motivation where I share like a journaling prompt of something that's going on in my life that I'm journaling. And then every Thursday is truth talk Thursday, where I actually share something personal that's going on in my life and how I'm handling it. So I get an insider look of like the processes that I'm actually using and the tools that I'm actually using to become more of a fully embodied sensual woman. I love that. And I think you shared some amazing tools today on this talk. And I think, you know, if people start to implement them or don't know where to start, like re-listen and do something from this. Like if you could take anything away, like choose one of the things and do it because you'll change for the better. So thank you so much for A, your work that you're doing in the world. Thank you, darling. B, your passion because it just like <laughs> literally magnetized through the screen. So you're fully embodying your magnetism that you teach. And C, thank you so much for um, yeah sharing all of your tools and and wisdom today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. I feel honored. I feel grateful. I feel honored and grateful that everyone who tuned in right here, right now, out of everything that you could be doing that you're listening right here, right now, that always touches me. And thank you so much, Sam, for your passion. And you're like, yes, let's do this. It's going to be about sexuality this year. And we're going to like knock their socks off and make them understand that it's safe and it's okay. Yep, absolutely. All, all about it. <laughs> thank you. All right, darling.